Hello, anyone. Welcome to uh, the December edition of Roadmap of the Stars. Now, I'm going to try not to make this too long. Everyone's recovering from the holiday season. Maybe some people are still recovering from some eggnog hangovers. Um, but I wanted, to, I wanted to put this out. We were going to do it a little earlier, but uh, we got a little behind with it. And we figured that we'd just... Uh, everyone's, you know, stressed about the holidays, and, you know, now it's after the holidays, now everyone's relaxing, now is a better time to, uh, take in some of the, some more information without worrying about other holiday stressors. Um, before we get started, uh, you might at times hear our, uh, co-producer slash writer slash my fiance Becca, talking up during the show. Um, she did a lot of help doing the cultural research for some of this stuff, and, uh, I'm gonna try not to go too long, um, but we're still going to have our, uh, time after the show for any additional questions that people might have. But with that said, we'll go ahead and get started with our holiday version of A Roadmap of the Stars. For thousands of years, this time of year has symbolized light conquering darkness, good conquering evil. But now we know that darkness is not necessarily evil. In fact, it's contrast to darkness that allows us to appreciate the light. The stars are up during the day, but we can't see them because the sun is just far too bright. It's only when the sun goes down, ushering in the night, that we can see the beauty of the stars. And after this show, you'll not only be able to see them, you'll also be able to know what they are and what stories they tell. It's not accidental for Christmas, the darkest season. Uh, this darkest season is when they celebrated the birth of Jesus, their symbolic light of the world. Or that the Jewish people celebrated a time where a uh, mystical light allowed them to prevail over their attackers. It's not coincidental that we decorate our homes with evergreens, though the outdoors appear cold and lifeless, or that we sing of burning the Yule log in the hearth at the coldest time of year. Our traditions today were born out of our ancestors' response to the same things we're experiencing right now. Cold, dark days. And of our, uh, in the anticipation for warmth and light returning. When they experienced darkness, they turned to the skies, and that's what we're going to do tonight. Right now, I'm showing you guys a simulation of what our sky would look like at around 8 o'clock tonight. Hopefully, you know, optimistically, I'll be done with the show by then. So this sky will be what you first see if you go out after the show. Now, the first set of stars that I want to point out to you guys are these seven stars right down here. One of them is behind a tree right here, but there are seven stars here, I promise you. And they appear to make the shape of a cup with a handle on it. This is, of course, the famous figure of the Big Dipper. Now, the Big Dipper is really useful to astronomers because we use it to do something called star hopping. Now, star hopping is where you take brighter, more noticeable stars, and you use them to find dimmer, less noticeable stars. And the Big Dipper is really good at doing this in a lot of different ways. The Big Dipper points to a ton of awesome stars and constellations throughout our entire night sky, but there's one particular star that we're going to use the Big Dipper to find, and it's a very special star. What we do, or how we use the Big Dipper to find the star, is we take the front two stars in the pot of the Big Dipper, and we're going to call them our pointer stars. And we call them that because if we imagine connecting the two stars together and going straight out, they point to that very special star. This star, right here. This star's name is Polaris, and Polaris is our North Star. Now there's a bit of a misconception behind the North Star or Polaris, First off, people, especially around this time of year, think that it was the star of Bethlehem, that the Christian Bible says that led three wise men to the place where their Jesus was born. Even with all of our advanced technology today, we don't really know for sure what the star of Bethlehem could have been if it was there at all. But what we do know is that it was not Polaris. 
There are some ideas about what the Star of Bethlehem could have been. Uh, could have been a comet, uh, a supernova, or a star exploding, or a conjunction of two planets aligning with each other to form an abnormally bright dot in the sky. But what we do absolutely know is that it was not Polaris. Uh, because for the three wise men in the Christian Bible to interpret the Star of Bethlehem as signifying the birth of a king, it has to be something out of the ordinary. Which brings me to the second misconception about the North Star, or Polaris. People mistakenly think that it is the brightest star in our nighttime sky, and while it does look bright in the software I'm using, when you go out tonight and find Polaris, you'll find that it's actually pitifully dim. Quite ordinary looking, not birth of a king looking at all. No, Polaris was not the star of Bethlehem, and it is not the brightest star in our uh, nighttime sky. But it is famous for a completely different reason, and it's given in the name. The North Star is famous because it is a star that is always directly in the north. Now, some of you might be a little skeptical because you may have noticed quite a few stars that might be considered directly in the north right now. But Polaris is special. Polaris got its official name Polaris because it's our pole star, a star right above the Earth's North Pole. And as such, as the night goes on, as the Earth rotates on its axis, we see all, all the other stars appear to spin around Polaris, but if I keep my mouse still, the North Star doesn't appear to move very much at all. So the North Star is always directly in the North. Now going back to the time that I was just at... The North Star is part of another recognizable figure, another collection of seven stars. Since we have a Big Dipper, it would only make sense that we also have a Little Dipper. And indeed, the North Star is at the end of the handle of the Little Dipper. So we start here at the North Star, and we have two more stars in the handle to make three stars, just like the Big Dipper, and four stars in the pot, also just like the Big Dipper. So here we have the Little Dipper. Now, I'm sure some of you guys are thinking, well, if the North Star is part of a figure all of its own, why on Earth do we have to use a whole nother figure to find it? Why, why should we use the Big Dipper to find the North Star when it's part of its own figure already? Well, you might have noticed that some of the other stars that make up the Little Dipper are even dimmer than Polaris. So even in really good viewing conditions, you may find it a little difficult to actually spot the Little Dipper. But the Big Dipper is much more noticeable, containing much brighter stars. You can see the Big Dipper from a lot of different places on Earth. Even when I used to do shows in the city of Pittsburgh, I was still able to see the bright stars that made up the Big Dipper. Even next to a huge football stadium. That's how bright these stars appear to be. So as long as you remember to use your pointer stars in the Big Dipper, they will always be there to help you find Polaris. So when you know you, uh, when you can see Polaris, you know you're looking due north. So consequently, the south is behind you, west is to the left, and east is to the right. Polaris is the most reliable compass you will ever have, especially the sailors out on the oceans. Our ancestors realized how good of a navigational star that Polaris was. Now, as part of my job, I love asking people what their favorite constellations are. And sometimes people tell me that their favorite constellations are the Big and Little Dippers. Now, there's nothing wrong at all with liking the Big and Little Dippers. They are pretty great. But they're actually not constellations. They're what's called an asterism. And an asterism is just a fancy word for a star picture. Aster meaning star. Ism meaning shape or figure, asterism, star picture. And you can make up as many asterisms as you want in the sky, as many, as many figures as you like. Like I could look over here and I could see the Hanukkah dreidel. I could look over here and see the Christmas tree. But these are all unofficial figures. You can make up as many of them as you like. Your very own personal star pictures or asterisms. 
But what makes constellations different from asterisms like the Big and Little Dippers is that constellations are agreed upon by all astronomers throughout the world. And the importance of that is it makes a map of our nighttime sky. The reason that the Big Dipper isn't a constellation, even though it's so well known to us, it's probably one of the first figures you learn about in astronomy, heck, it was the first figure I pointed out during the show, is because it used to be and still is different things to different cultures. To us, we see the Big Dipper, we see the spoon, or the ladle, but to English cultures, they see the plow, so here would be the plow that tills the soil and the thing that you connect to the horse the plow. A German cultures, they see a wagon. Again, you know, here's the wagon. Here's what they connect to the horse. In ancient Chinese cultures, they had a completely different star map from the Western Greco-Roman societies, the ancient Greeks and Romans that we get most of our constellations from today. So it would be very difficult for these uh, astronomers from other cultures to tell other astronomers in different cultures what they find in the nighttime sky and where it's at if they're not even agreeing on what they're looking at or even calling them. This was a big problem in astronomy until fairly recently in 1922 where astronomers from all over the world gathered together and agreed on the 88 constellations that would populate our nighttime sky, standardizing the nighttime sky, making a map of the nighttime sky. So no matter what culture you belong to, no matter what language you spoke, if one astronomer said the name of a constellation to another astronomer, they will always know exactly what part of the sky they are talking about. And though the Big and Little Dippers are not constellations themselves, they are part of some of these bigger constellations. For instance, the Big Dipper is part of the constellation Ursa Major, the Big Bear. Likewise, the Little Dipper is part of the constellation Ursa Minor, the Little Bear. One of my favorite constellations, it's very cute. But there's many other constellations in our northern sky as well. Now to find some of these other constellations in the northern sky, we're going to use our trick that we used before to find the North Star. So we're going to start at our pointer stars in the Big Dipper in Ursa Major. And we're going to connect the two pointer stars together and go straight out, just like we did to find the North Star. But instead of stopping, we're going to keep going through, still in a straight line, till we get close to these five brighter stars over here, in the shape of an M. At different times of the night, it might look like an E, or a W, or a 3. But this represents Cassiopeia, and she is the Queen of Ethiopia. Now, sometimes, not all times, but sometimes when there's a queen, there is often a king. And in Cassiopeia's case, there is a king sitting right next to her. If we use these two stars that are part of the sharpest angle in Cassiopeia, she points straight down to a set of five dimmer stars in the shape of a house. Some people like to see a squished home plate. I'm very fond of seeing a boxy-headed clown with a party hat on. But this is no clown, this is Cepheus and he is the king of Ethiopia. And finally, but certainly not least, uh, sneaking in between Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, starting about halfway in between the two dippers, is a long winding tail that wraps around Ursa Minor, away from Cepheus, with a head right down here, is one of my favorite uh, constellations, Draco the Dragon. So all of these constellations that I've shown you so far, Ursa Major, Ursa Minor, Cassiopeia, Cepheus, and Draco, are all very special constellations to us here in the Northern Hemisphere on Earth. These are, these are constellations that are up all year round if you're around 40 degrees latitude on the Earth, like we are here in Pennsylvania. And this is where I'm simulating this nighttime sky around the Pittsburgh area. Uh, all these constellations are up all year round, so no matter what time of year you go out, if you look to the north, you can always practice your stargazing in the northern sky. Because even six months from now, if you wanted to find the Big Dipper tonight, you know, you'd find it down here close to the horizon at the bottom right of the North Star. But six months from now, 
it's on the opposite side of Ursa Minor, to the upper left now. Now, though all these constellations that I've shown you are in different locations, they're still up even six months from now. And then six months still, they're back to where we would see them tonight. So the northern sky is an excellent part of the sky to practice your astronomy. These constellations don't change throughout the seasons. However, there are an interesting set of constellations that you can only see at certain times of the year. And these are called our seasonal constellations because you can only see them in the early evening sky uh, certain seasons out of the year. Now to see them, we have to move away from our north sky. We have to look towards the south now. Now these constellations in the south are the very constellations that our ancestors used long ago to uh, as a ma as a uh, a calendar and clock, because not only did our ancestors use the stars as a map and a compass like they do with the North Star to uh, navigate their way around, for instance, out at sea. They used the seasonal constellations to tell what time of year it was and what seasons are on their way. Based on the constellations that they saw in the early evening sky, they could tell when springtime was coming. You needed to get their fields ready to plant their crops so they could feed themselves, their families, their village. But they could also tell when winter was coming. They needed to bunker down their houses so they could stay warm during the cold, cold winters. So our ancestors were on top of things uh, in terms of preparing for seasons even before we had phones and computers and uh, globally accepted calendars. Now, we understand today what causes seasons to change, but our ancestors didn't really have a good understanding of it. And when our ancestors didn't quite understand something, they... Uh, would do you know certain rituals they made celebrations they uh had things that they did at certain times of the year to ensure good luck good harvest and all those other things but what does it mean to have our seasons change what do we understand about seasons changing today well our earth is as it orbits around the sun it is tilted about 23 and a half degrees. Now, you don't really have to remember that number. Remembering that number isn't really that important. What is important remembering is that our Earth is tilted. Now, I know when I was younger, uh, maybe around fourth grade, maybe third grade, um, I was under the impression that seasons changed because the Earth got closer or further away from our sun and on the surface you know it seems like a logical hypothesis because our sun is this giant glowing heat radiating source that enables us to have liquid water on earth warmth during the day and the reason it gets cold at night when we're not facing the sun anymore however our proximity how close we are to the sun does not dictate our seasons it is the tilt of the Earth. So during the summertime here in the Northern Hemisphere, so up here is the Northern Hemisphere where we live, and down here is the Southern Hemisphere of the Earth. During the summertime, the North Northern Hemisphere is tilted toward the sun. And these sun rays here, these excellently drawn sun rays, uh, more of these rays hit the Northern Hemisphere of the Earth. And when the sunlight when the sunlight hits our atmosphere hits the earth that's what ends up warming up the earth these rays get absorbed by the waters and the land masses on earth and it gets re-radiated as heat or the atmosphere absorb it absorbs it and distributes it as heat and so when the northern hemisphere is pointed or tilted toward the sun we get a lot more of those rays hitting us so we get more of the heat. During winter, the northern hemisphere is tilted away from the sun as it spins on its axis. 
And so we see a lot less of this light ends up hitting the Northern Hemisphere. More of that light is hitting the Southern Hemisphere, which is now tilted toward the sun. And so we get a lot less sunlight and a lot less, you know, a lot less sunlight also means less uh, heat for us in the Northern Hemisphere. Now, during the equinoxes, like spring and fall, uh, equinox means equal night, equinox, equal night. Uh, and that's referring to the fact that during the equinox, the sun is essentially right over the Earth's equator, this red line here. So the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere get the same amount of sunlight hitting them. So what does that look like? to us here on Earth. Well, this is what started different traditions for our ancestors. Let's go to springtime. Let's go to 12 o'clock springtime. Now, we see here that our sun uh, is it's at high noon, and as the months go on, as our Earth orbits around the sun, the sun will appear to get higher and higher in our sky. So this is where we are right now. We are at springtime and the earth goes, whoops, hold on, my bad. Uh, the earth goes counterclockwise around the sun. So we're right here. And as we move to the summer solstice, the sun will appear to get higher and higher in our sky. So now we're at the summer solstice about. So we went from spring to summer. So it looks like it's getting higher in our sky. And this is called the summer solstice. Solstice, well, earlier I said equinox means equal night. Solstice means sun still. Because as we transition from spring to summer, our sun gets higher and higher in the sky until it slows down and appears to stand still. And then as we get to fall, the sun appears to sink lower and lower in our sky again. Until we get to winter, where we this is the winter solstice, where the sun appears to stand still again. Solstice, sun still. And then it goes back towards springtime, where it appears to get higher and higher in our sky. Now, we understand that. We're not really troubled by the fact that our sun gets lower and lower in the sky. The only thing we're troubled about about this is that we have less time during the day, and when we go to work, it's nighttime. When you get out of work, it's nighttime. It's never any fun. But that's about the, uh, the extent of our worries today. But to our ancestors that didn't really understand what was going on, they didn't have that perspective. So after the summertime, they just saw the sun getting lower and lower and lower in the sky, and they got scared that the sun would never come back. So today we understand the sun sinks lower and lower in our sky because of our perspective here on Earth and where the Earth is in its orbit, but again, the ancient, these ancient cultures, our ancestors, they didn't have this understanding. Therefore, different cultures had different ways of looking at the winter solstice. Uh, some cultures celebrated the cycle of life. Some feared the sun would never return if they didn't make their sacrifices or worships. Uh, for instance, the, the Mayan culture, uh, the solstice symbolized the circle of life and the reincarnation of their kings. They saw death and darkness being only the first step of rebirth. And so because they saw it this way, uh, winter solstice coming meant more nighttime. And so they compared this to their death and darkness and seeing it as the first step of rebirth because they knew, uh, or at least because of these celebrations, they had a feeling that the sun would rise higher into the sky as their kings, you know, become reborn. Uh, so this this analogy went with their summer solstice and their viewings of how the sun moved around. Uh, the ancient Egyptians thought winter occurred, or the winter solstice where the sun got lower and lower in the sky, uh, because the sun, whom they 
uh, believed was a god called Ra in their mythology, they thought he was sick. And since he was the sun god, they attributed with the sun getting lower and lower in the sky as Ra becoming sick. Uh, they celebrated the winter solstice, the shortest day of the year, because it meant from that point on that Ra would be soon uh, would be well again soon, and the sun would go higher and higher in their sky. In Northern Europe, ancient Celtic priests decorated temples with evergreens as a symbol of everlasting life because they, you know, evergreen trees stay green all year round, whereas other trees lose their leaves and become barren throughout winter. They thought that evergreen trees were the special plant of their sun god Boulder. These ancient priests also decorated with mistletoe, believing it could aid in fertility just as the solstice meant the earth would soon be fertile again. And so that's kind of where the tradition of mistletoe came from and kissing under mistletoe being, you know, the first act of fertilizing. <laughs> I'm sorry. Saturnalia was a Greco-Roman festival to celebrate the year's end and the new year's beginning. Uh, people exchanged gifts and masters served their servants in a kind of role swapping ceremony. It was a time to forget about the pressures of normal life and relax for a while, you know. And so most of our, or some of our modern holiday traditions come from Saturnalia and from the Germanic festival of Yule, where uh, huge logs were burned. And these were the precursors to the Yule log tradition of burning logs in the family fireplace. Our modern day Christmas caroling is also thought to have had its roots in the ancient festivals of Yule. But bringing in wreaths and Christmas trees into the house instead of just decorating the evergreens generally came later in the 1500s. It was, wi it was a widely held belief that uh, Martin Luther, the 16th century Protestant reformer, uh, first added lighted candles to a tree, was one of the first people to do this. Um, in terms of Christmas trees, anyway, we had the uh, Saturnalia Greco-Romans decorating uh, uh, their evergreens, but Martin Luther in the 16th century popularized it on uh, Christmas trees. On his and, and he did this because walking toward his home one winter evening, he was awed by the brilliance of stars twinkling amongst the evergreen trees or through the evergreen trees and to capture this scene for his family he erected a tree in the main room and wired its branches with lighted candles i i, I was looking at i was looking at our our co my my co-producer because she has her hand eagerly on the push to talk button i didn't know if she was going to say something oh no i was just like uh yeah just to clarify i mean like the ancient Romans, ancient Greeks, and the Druids up north, they decorated with evergreen, but it was Martin Luther, according to my research, that first added the lighted candles. So that was his, like, um, contribution to it, and it was also just really cool that it was specifically to reenact or recreate that scene of stars um, on, like, in the backdrop of silhouetted pine. So the winter solstice throughout the history of humanity was a time of gathering, feasting, merriment, and or offerings. The Greco-Romans with their Saturnalia, the Anglo-Saxons with their Yule, a time which people feared the sun would not return from its downward descent, or use the celebrations as a way to push back against the cold and darkness of winter. Our holiday traditions today stem from the way our ancestors reacted to the darkness and cold caused by the northern hemisphere tilting away from the sun. And because this was a shared experience of different northern hemispherical cultures, these same themes of light and good conquering darkness and evil were shared by different cultures. So we're going to go back to tonight so I can share some of the uh, seasonal constellations uh, with you guys, some of my favorite ones and some that might even seem pretty familiar to you guys. Now, the first, um, 
The first set of stars I want to point out to you guys is probably one that's really recognizable right now, really easy to catch, and this is rising out of our horizon. Um, it'll be up right when the sun goes down. It starts to get the darkest it can around uh, 6.30, so oh, this, this constellation is likely already up right now. Again, this is 8 o'clock, so in 30 minutes from now, this is going to be your view if you guys go outside. So the first constellation is this guy right over here, recognizable by the three stars that form his belt. This is the famous constellation of Orion, the Hunter. Now, I love pointing out Orion because all year round people ask me where Orion is in the sky. He is a wintertime constellation, so you only see him in the early evening of the winter uh, months. Now, he will be up in the sky uh, around this time again, going all the way to... Is that April? Yeah. So, Orion in April, just as the sun goes down, will be at our western horizon, and the month following that, he will be too low to see. So, as we get into... as we uh, Before the summer solstice arrives, Orion will have set. So... During the winter season, you're able to see him up. Uh, during the in winter, uh, early to mid-spring seasons, you're able to see Orion. Now, Orion is a fantastic constellation because uh, not only is he a really good guidepost through the nighttime sky, just like the Big Dipper is, we can use Orion to find some other interesting stars and constellations, he also has some pretty interesting things inside of him as well, or some of the stars that make him up. Most notably, I want to talk about the star at his upper left shoulder and at his lower right foot. So these two stars have a very distinct difference between them, and it's a little easier to see in here. If it's harder to notice at night, that's completely natural. We as humans are very bad at detecting this difference in low light situations like the nighttime sky. But more notably, most notably, these two stars are very different in color. You can tell a lot about a star just by the fact that they are different colors. Namely, you can roughly tell what their temperature is. Red stars like Betelgeuse, his upper left shoulder is Betelgeuse. Red stars like Betelgeuse are the coolest among star colors. They can be in low, as low in temperature as about uh, 3,500 to 3,000 degrees fair, uh, Kelvin, or that's more like 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit to about as low as maybe 45 hundred to three thousand degrees Fahrenheit while still being able to emit light uh, but blue stars like Rigel are the hottest among star colors they can be as hot as 40 even up to 60,000 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface of their stars you know when I say the surface of a star I don't mean like here on earth you couldn't stand on a star. Stars are just hot, glowing balls of gas and plasma out in space. When I say the surface of a star, I just mean the outermost edge of the star, where the light leaves the star. We notice the star's color. And most of the time when astronomers talk about star temperatures, they're talking about the outermost layer of the star. Now, it may seem kind of counterintuitive to us here on Earth, blue stars being the hottest and red stars being the coolest, because of our conventional way of thinking about temperature here on Earth. Um, whenever you want hot water, you go over to your sink, you turn the red faucet. You want cold water, you turn the blue faucet. Anytime you go to a grocery store and you want to find the hottest bottle of hot sauce, you look for a bottle plastered with the color red to indicate fire and hot. But if you're looking for ice, you look for a machine plastered with the color blue to indicate cold and ice. But instead of thinking of our conventional way of thinking with stars, think more if you've ever sat in front of a roaring campfire or you watched a candle burn. Down at the base of the fire where it's freshly burning that wood 
fuel, coal, or the wick of the candle. That is freshly released energy. And that freshly released energy is very hot, and so it will appear to be kind of bluish or white. But as that fire extend out, extends outwards, that energy cools very quickly, and it turns to yellow and orange, and at the very edge of the fire, where it appears the most red, is the coolest part of the fire. Now, I don't, I'm not condoning, I'm not encouraging you to stick your hands in any part of a fire. It is all very, very hot. But this, this way of thinking about star colors and their temperatures is much more comparable to fire. Because that's what they are. Fire is plasma. It's heated energy. Uh, stars is are plasma. They're heated energy. And so they kind of govern by that same idea. So in terms of star colors, like this, if you've ever gone to... I mean, I we've gone to stores. We might not have, had, have gone to stores much in the past year. But uh, if you ever make your way back to a store without dying... Uh, and you're looking for LED light bulbs, for instance. You might notice on them, they might say like, uh, like 6,000K or 12,000K. That is referring to this. It is referring to black body radiators like stars. The temperatures would correlate with their colors. So me, when I go shopping for bulbs, I like bulbs around the 9,000 range. I like that that cool white light, but a lot of the times they sell bulbs that are around the 6,000 range. So they kind of have a warmer orange glow to them. So these, these numbers here have meaning on those uh, LED bulbs. They are saying that the light that they emit is comparable to the temperature of a black body radiator or the temperature of a star at an equivalent uh at that equivalent temperature now the bulbs aren't that hot they're just the way they work is they're essentially simulating the the color that uh that you want and classifying it as a black body radiator but so that's 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 what is on those led bulbs just a little you know back history of that now going back to orion being oh before before i continue if you go out tonight try to look for some star colors a lot of stars in the sky have different colors it can be hard to immediately notice but now that you know to look out for it try to notice some star colors and try to compare different temperatures of stars to each other based on this idea and we'll have this uh this show up on our website and up on facebook so you can always reference back to it and um and we'll, you know we even uh we have uh after our shows we often have um supplementary info and uh we can put up star colors up on our supplementary info again we might have it on our last roadmap of the stars on our website as well but this will be here so you can come back to it find some star temperatures look at this chart and try to guess some star colors just ba or star, star temperatures just based on their color what quick question um would a telescope i know like stars aren't usually a great telescope target because they usually still just look like dots right. but does a telescope help you to see the color of the star better absolutely so telescopes just by nature just gather more light and if you're tr having trouble looking at the color of a star you get a telescope and you point it at it so it gathers more light and you might be able to notice its color a little bit better in fact there is a um a particular star where is it? Is it is it still up? Uh, just barely. There is a particular star in the Summer Triangle, which I'll show you in a little bit if we uh, if I manage to get to it. But there's a star right down here, and its name is Albireo. And to the naked eye, it might look like one single white star. But if you point a telescope at it, you might be able to resolve that it is actually two stars of different colors, uh, an orangish red star and a blue star. So to the naked eye, sometimes you might not be able to notice a star's color, but with a telescope, it can definitely help with your ability to see those colors. 
So Orion is a great guidepost in our nighttime sky. We can use him to find some of these other stars. If we use the three uh, stars in his belt and we connect them together just like we did with the Big Dipper in our pointer stars, we connect all three stars together and go down to the left, it will point to a star that is just rising out of the horizon at 8. I'm going to move us to 10 o'clock just so you get a better view of the constellation that it's a part of as well. So now we're looking at 10 o'clock tonight. These belt stars point down and to the left uh, where it points to a very bright star named Sirius. And Sirius is the brightest star in the constellation of Canis Major, Orion's big hunting dog. Now Sirius is not just the brightest star in the constellation of Canis Major, uh, Sirius is the brightest star in our entire nighttime sky. And because of the misconception about Polaris, people often confuse Sirius with the North Star, because they often think that the North Star is the brightest star in the sky, and then they see Sirius, which is the brightest star in the sky, and think it's the North Star. But now we know that the North Star, back here, if we use the Big Dipper to find the North Star, it is again very pitifully dim, and though it looks brighter in the program, it still pales in comparison to the bright star Sirius. So using Orion's belt, we can go down to the left and find the brightest star in our nighttime sky in the constellation of Canis Major, his big hunting dog. And if we go back to Orion's belt, we connect all three stars again and go up to the right this time, it points to a V-shape of stars here, with a very bright red star, which we now know is a cool star. Sirius is a white star, so it is on the hotter end of the spectrum right up here, around 20,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the bright red star in the V-shape of stars here is named Aldebaran, which is an Arabic word which roughly translates into the Eye of the Bull, which is fitting because this is the brightest star in the constellation of Taurus, the Bull. Now, if the name Taurus sounds familiar to you guys, it probably shouldn't be too surprising because he is one of 12 of what are called our zodiacal constellations. And we can find another one of our zodiacal constellations if we take Rigel and Betelgeuse again, and we connect these two stars together in a straight line, and then follow them up to the left like this, we'll come to a brighter blue and red star and their names are Pollux and Castor, and they are the names of the twins of Gemini, the twins. To the, uh, I won't, I won't take all the time to point out all of these, but then we have Cancer, we have a backwards question mark over here with another bright star named Regulus. Uh, which is the brightest star in Leo the Lion, and Regulus roughly translates into King Star. So we have Leo the Lion, Cancer the Crab, Gemini the Twins, Taurus the Bull. To the left of Taurus the Bull, we have... Nope, that's not... I don't want that. See, that's the, that's the unfortunate thing about this particular program. I can't just get rid of one. I have to get rid of all of them. Uh, I think I need to shoot a little lower. So here is Mars. I was all I, I clicked all the way over in Pegasus. We have Pisces. There you are. Aries is a sneaky one. Aries the ram, Pisces the fish. And so our zodiacal constellations appear to make a line across our nighttime sky. But it's not just any line. It's a very special line. This line is called the ecliptic. And the ecliptic is the apparent path that our sun takes across the sky throughout the year. So we see different months labeled here on this line. These dictate where the sun would be at a certain time of year. So December 1st, we would find the sun here in a constellation called Scorpius, the scorpion. Uh, January 29th, we would find the sun over here 
in Capricornus, the Myrrh Goat. And April 15th, we would find the sun here in Pisces, the fish. Now, not only is the ecliptic the apparent path of our sun, it's also the close path of our moon and planets as well. What I've brought up here is the line of our other seven major planets, not counting Earth, of course, because we are standing on Earth, but we see that they keep a roughly neat line along the ecliptic, or along our zodiacal constellations as well. So you would expect that if the planets and the moon appear to travel across this line, we should expect to see a planet at some point. Well, fortunately, at 8 o'clock, you'll be able to see a planet high up in your sky right now. And now it might be a little obvious about what object right now is the planet in the sky. Um, it might not be so obvious when you go outside. So I want to teach you how to know if what you're looking at is a star or a planet. Now, the first question you want to ask yourself is, is what I'm looking at in a zodiacal constellation? That is one. That is the most important question. If the answer is no, what I'm looking at is not in a zodiacal constellation like Pisces, Aquari uh, Aquarius, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer. If it's not in a zodiacal constellation, then what you're looking at is most certainly not a planet. But if it is in a zodiacal constellation, then it might be. It's not guaranteed that it is, but it's important that that first question is yes, it is a, in a zodiacal constellation. The second question you should ask yourself is, is what I'm looking at twinkling? Stars appear to twinkle in our sky because they are very, very far away. Stars put out a lot of light. Our sun is a star. And when the sun is up during the day, it just floods our atmosphere with light and we can't see anything else. But stars are much, 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 much further away than our sun. And so their light spreads out. Much like if you were to go outside and you take a flashlight, you point it in a random direction, uh, it can only go so far before the light spreads out and dims to the point where it doesn't really illuminate much anymore. Well, that's what's happening with these stars. Their light has to travel across trillions and trillions of miles of space. And by the time their light reached us, that light is very spread out. It's very dilute, in a sense. And so that light hitting our atmosphere is heavily affected by it. Our atmosphere is filled with water vapor, dust particles, ice particles, and that light bounces around in the sky and it reaches our eyes at a bunch of different angles, so the stars appear to twinkle. Planets, though they are far away from us in human scales, are much closer than stars are. Now, planets don't emit their own light. They reflect our sun's light. And so, by the time light leaves our sun, bounces off of one of the planets in our solar system, and reaches Earth into our eyes, it is a lot less affected by our atmosphere. So they will not appear to twinkle. So planets do not twinkle, or do not appear to twinkle. Stars do appear to twinkle. So if, you, if what you're looking at is not twinkling, then what you're most likely looking at is either a planet, a satellite, the space station, uh, the moon. The moon's very obvious. But, so those are the two questions you should ask yourself. Is what I'm looking at twinkling, and is what I'm looking at in a zodiacal constellation? If the answers to those questions are no and yes respectively, then what you're likely looking at is a planet. Now, one of the first planets that, or the only planet I think that's up right now, is Mars. And it is in Pisces the fish. You'll see the V-shape, of the much bigger V-shape constellation, uh, to the right of Orion right now in the sky, upper right of Orion, is Mars. And it appears very, very red. 
Now, Mars appears red for a different reason than stars. Stars appear red because of their temperature. Mars is not a hot planet at all. It is a very cold desert planet uh, covered in iron oxide. The iron oxide is what makes it look red. Now, I'm sure that you've seen iron oxide before, if you've left a bike out too long, if you've left a metal pipe layout in the yard uh, or in the rain, it is just simply rust. Iron oxide is rust, and Mars is covered in it. And rust is notoriously very red. Uh, so when the sun's light bounces off of Mars' surface, all of that red iron oxide reflects red light back to the Earth, and so to us here on Earth, it appears very red in our sky. Now, Mars is a really fascinating planet, mainly uh, because of its topography and its history. Um, Mars may have looked like Earth at one point in the fact that it likely, or it did, have uh, liquid water oceans on its surface long, long ago. But Mars is about one-fourth to one-third the size of the Earth. So its core ended up cooling, and it lost its magnetic field. And the magnetic field for Earth is what protects our atmosphere from solar winds and solar radiation. And so when Mars lost its magnetic field, the Sun's radiation stripped the atmosphere off of Mars and boiled its oceans and stripped away that uh, the water vapor as well. And so we have Mars now as a dead desert world. We don't know. There might be uh, bacterial life, small organi organic uh, uh, life underneath the surface of Mars in underground pools of water, but we don't know yet. It's very hard for us to uh, detect life on Mars with the equipment that we have there now, uh, but things are looking promising to get certain, um, certain equipment to Mars to test for that very thing. But for now, what we do know about Mars is that its topography is very interesting. Not only does it have Canali, which is a, an Italian word for canals, that a, oh, it was an Italian astronomer. I don't think it was Galileo, but I will, I will look up the Italian astronomer and put it on our supplementary info after the show. Uh, but it was an Italian astronomer that looked at Mars and actually drew out all of the uh, canali or what we know now is uh, dried up riverbeds on Mars. But what the most interesting thing is Mars hosts the largest canyon in the solar system. Olympus, uh, not Olympus Mons, Valles Marineris. Valles Marineris is about as long as the entire uh, continental United States is wide and is about as wide as the Grand Canyon on Earth is long. And it's about seven miles deep on top of all of that. Now, the Grand Canyon here on Earth was caused by uh, water erosion, water uh, going through the path that it took to carve out the stone and create the Grand Canyon as we see it today. But what caused Mars Canyon, Valles Marineris, is, in my opinion, a lot more interesting. Mars is like Earth also in the fact that it once had more active tectonic activity, meaning that here on Earth we have continental plates that move around. Um, once upon a time, all of the continents that are spread out all over Earth were collected in one place called Pangaea, and these continental plates shifted, and we have these uh, continents separated by oceans that we have today. And that's because we have tectonic activity that shifts our land masses around. 
Here on Earth, we have about somewhere between 7 and 14 major uh, continental plates, but Mars only had two, the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere. And when those shifted around, it ripped the planet open, creating the huge scar that is Valles Marineris. Now, there are other places on Mars, like if we get in closer, we can see that there are other places smaller diverging canyons these were carved out they were large, likely carved out by water that was on mars at one point uh, like we see right around here and up here uh, but the bulk of it here was made by the tectonic plates shifting and if we land on mars and we get right into the crater we can see just how deep this goes now it might be deceiving but these walls uh in some places are about uh i'm sorry i said seven miles deep are about four miles deep in some of these places and it is very very wide so behind us we have uh one of the walls and since mars is so small and the valles marineris is so wide we can't even see the other wall from this side here Now, that's not the only impressive topographical location that Mars has. Mars not only hosts the largest canyon in the solar system, it hosts the largest volcano as well. Olympus Mons. Olympus Mons is about as wide as the entire country of France and is about as tall as three Mount Everests. Now, here in this view, uh, it might look like Olympus Mons is very, very steep and from a volcano that is boasted to be three times taller than Mount Everest, you would think that it would be steep. But remember, not only is it very, very tall, it is very, very wide. Again, about the size of the entire country of France. And so if we land down on Mars again, and we look at Olympus Mons, it is very, very shallow. You could probably walk up Olympus Mons pretty easily. It's not very steep at all. Um, I mean, the biggest struggle is the fact that you would, to get from the base of Olympus Mons to the peak, depending on where you start, on average, you'd be walking half the distance of the width of France, but the grade would not feel really that impressive. Now, not only is Olympus Mons... Uh, very, very tall, but Mars's atmosphere is also very thin. And so we can even see here that Olympus Mons actually sticks up almost out of Mars's atmosphere. And Mars's atmosphere, I don't we I don't know personally what Mars's atmosphere looked like when it might have been more like Earth. Um if there was any way to find out if there was oxygen, that would be really a big discovery uh, in terms of what kind of life might have existed on Mars. I personally don't know many ways that you could prove that there used to be oxygen there. Uh, maybe uh, trapped, maybe trapped gases and rocks. But uh, today, its atmosphere is mostly carbon dioxide. Um, and normally carbon dioxide is a very potent greenhouse gas but it doesn't it's it's very thin it's uh mars's atmosphere is still very very thin so it's still a very cold place um now you would need a pretty good telescope in order to see uh the scar on mars but it is very possible to see this the olympus uh not Olympus Mons, 
Maybe Olympus Mons if you had a really good telescope, but Valus Marineris you'd be able to see if you had even a, you know, a, a decent telescope. Our 130, 120 yeah. millimeter telescope, we're just barely able to see Valus Marineris on Mars. So it's a good, it's a good target currently to see if you have a good powered telescope. Even if you don't, you can look at it and be a slightly bigger red dot. Yeah. Now there are some other planets that are up early in the evening. Unfortunately, now they have set, but they were in the news recently uh, because of something called a conjunction. Now, I'm going to take us back to about 7... Not 7, but 6.30. And... Oh man, it is really low. Right now. So, maybe more like... 6 o'clock? Yeah, if you want to see Saturn and Jupiter, you'll want to get out as... Pretty much as soon as it's dark yeah. to make sure you don't miss them so there are there is jupiter and saturn over here in our southwestern horizon kind of shortly after the sun sets um and they were in the news recently because they were uh they had uh made a conjunction on the 21st now what does a conjunction mean a conjunction is when two objects occupy the same right ascension. And these lines going down into the horizon like this from north to south are lines of right ascension. And during the 21st, we go back to it, they were very close to, uh, at some point between the 20th and 21st, they created a conjunction where they shared the same right ascension, but they were so close together that even with the naked eye, they looked like one elongated star. Um, now we have some pictures that were donated to us that we can put up on the supplementary info page, but even though the... Um, the conjunction is over, these objects are still uh, fantastic telescope objects and worth seeing if you get out early enough to spot them. So starting from when the sun sets probably around 5.30ish, you're going to see Jupiter come out right here and then shortly after you're going to see uh, Saturn come out as well, very close to it. So. I'd say about any time after the sun set to about 8 o'clock, um, or even earlier than that, 7, oh jeez. It's, it's short, it's, it's short-lived, so you'd have to get out pretty early, um, but it's worth seeing if you have a telescope, because then you'd be able to see Saturn's rings and, um, Jupiter's moons as well. And we'll put up some supplementary info page, but um, for now, I think I think that's a pretty good place to call the show. Um, Do you have something to say? You have your finger down on the button. No, just that I guess we'll open it up for questions. Um, I just like to close on just to like reflect on the fact that the days like I know in winter it seems like. Christmas to me seems like, okay, winter's starting, winter's cold and dark, but just keeping in mind the perspective of, like, because the winter solstice has happened, from now on, the days get longer, so that's something to keep in mind. These um, cultures that were celebrating this uh, time long before us, they were initially celebrating to try to convince the sun to come back, but then once they learned that year after year the sun came back it was a time of celebration because they knew from then on the days were going to get longer and that's you know in this cold dark time of year especially this year where you can all 
look forward to, you know, take any any reason to just uh, have a little hope and get excited and celebrate something. And that's a pretty good thing to celebrate in my book. So with all of that said, you know, go out tonight, find Orion in your southern sky, use him to help you find Sirius and Taurus the bull using the three stars in his belt to point down and up. Uh, look to the northern sky, practice finding the Big Dipper uh, in Ursa Major to use your pointer stars to find the North Star in Ursa Minor. Try to find some of the other constellations that I pointed out to you guys in the north, like Cassiopeia, uh, Cepheus, Draco. Again, these are excellent constellations to practice with because they're up all year round. And see if you can spot Mars. Mars is going to be bright and red. Try to find some uh, different star colors and uh, compare them to other stars for their temperatures, you know? But with that said, I really hope that you guys enjoyed it. Um, we're always trying to do new shows. We're always trying to put out new content to teach people about uh, astronomy and science and the world around them. So come back learn more, never stop asking questions because there's so much that we don't yet know and so much that we can all still learn together. And you should never feel ashamed for asking a question or not knowing something because it's an opportunity to learn more and uh, just discover more of the world around you. Um, if you're all set to go, you can of course, you know, uh, have a wonderful rest of your evening. Happy New Year. Uh, we'll probably be back in February with a new show, but we'll likely be trying to put out smaller contents in terms of posts on our Facebook page and our website. If you liked what we do and you want to see more of it and you want to help support us, we have a donation page on our website. Um, We're wise. even more helpful right now. Just tell all of your friends oh, yeah. and everyone that you know and the the grocery drop-off person at Walmart, when they ask if you want your bread up front, tell them about this show. Tell everyone. <laughs> when you're through a drive through say, I really want... This guy is really awesome. He talks about stars and stuff, and the person will talk back to you and say, Sir, this is a Wendy's. Just, you know, just tell everyone you can. Um, if you ever have questions, I know it can be hard to ask questions sometimes, especially in live settings. We have a place on our contact page on our website. Uh, Becca, can you post our website in the Facebook thing? Just type out our website. On the contact page, you can ask questions. All we, you don't have to put your name or anything. All we ask is that you put in your email address so that we can, uh, so that we can email you back with the answer. Uh, if you wanted to leave an anonymous suggestion, you can also do that on the contact page. Uh, the only thing that requires you to just put in your suggestion um, and send it to us. It's that easy. Um, and tell us what you liked. Tell us what you didn't like. Tell us if you thought the show was good. Tell us if you shot, thought the show was bad. There is no bad suggestions um, as long as you know you make them constructive so we can work off of them. There's, there's a lot there's of a lot. parallels in the different celebrations and the different belief systems as well because again they're influenced by the same things even if they're on the other side of the world if they see if they're in the northern hemisphere as well they're influenced by the same things and so that on top of people or humans just roaming around the world moving from place to place and taking with them their stories um you get the evolution of these holidays because Christmas does borrow a lot from Saturnalia and Yule and that's because people immigrated and Christmas came about in or at least modern day Christmas came about mainly in America um, and that's because a lot of these cultures migrated from uh, these Western European countries to America and they brought with them different pieces of their belief systems and they kind of meld together in this cooking and in, in this stew pot. <laughs>